Hello everyone, Dr. Mungli here. So in this video, I will be explaining absorption of monosaccharides in the intestine. This video is a continuation of my previous video which I have made on digestion of carbohydrates. The link for that video is appearing on the right upper corner, uh, corner now. I recommend you to watch that video on uh, digestion of carbohydrates for better understanding of absorption of monosaccharides because it is just the continuation of my previous video that is digestion of carbohydrates. Anyway, so do I carbohydrates are digested in the intestine so they are going to release monosaccharides that is glucose and then galactose and fructose. All these monosaccharides, they will be accumulated in the lumen of intestine. Now they need to be absorbed into the enterocyte. So I have drawn enterocyte here on the right corner, uh, right hand side. And for the absorption of monosaccharides, that is, we have three monosaccharides. They are glucose, I'll just write it as GLU and galactose on one side. And then we have glucose, galactose and fructose. So glucose, galactose and fructose, these are the three monosaccharides that will be present in the intestinal lumen after digestion of carbohydrates. So these are polar molecules, so they need uh, transporters to absorb into enterocytes. So there are two kinds of transporters that are participating in the absorption of monosaccharides from the lumen of intestine into the enterocytes. One such transporter is SGLT1. This SGLT1 as the name says it is sodium dependent glucose transporter 1. Why this is referred as SGLT1 number 1? It's because there is another transporter called as SGLT2 and that SGLT2 transporter is present in renal tubular cells for the reabsorption of glucose in the from the renal tubular lumen. Now the SGLT1 here which is located on the brush border epithelium of duodenum and jejunum so that participate in sodium dependent absorption of glucose along with the glucose it is going to absorb galactose also. Now the characteristic of SGLT1 here is it is sodium dependent transporter and it is secondary active carrier mediated transporter. You need to understand the terminology here that is secondary active carrier mediated sodium dependent glucose transporter. Why this is called as secondary active? It is because absorption of glucose it is sodium dependent. It means glucose is absorbed along with the sodium. So sodium which is there in the intestinal lumen, it has to be absorbed into the enterocyte cytoplasm. And that is, so it, it depends on the sodium gradient. So if the sodium concentration in the enterocyte is, cytoplasm is less, then the sodium concentration in the lumen of enterocyte, so sodium is moving from lumen into the enterocyte cytoplasm. And it means sodium gradient need to be maintained. Now who is going to maintain sodium gradient? So the sodium gradient is maintained by a basolateral surface located sodium potassium ATPase enzyme. And this sodium potassium ATPase what it does is going to take 3 sodium out of cytoplasm into the extracellular matrix. 3 sodium is move, they are moving out and in return it is going to bring to potassium in that is the job of sodium potassium ATPase so for this it is going to use ATP ATPs are broken down into ADPs so it is an active transporter sodium potassium ATPase is an active transporter so thereby it is going to maintain sodium gradient once the sodium gradient is maintained, so it means there is less sodium in the cytoplasm compared to the sodium that is present in the lumen. If that condition is there, if that gradient is maintained, sodium is going to move from lumen of intestine into the enterocyte. As the sodium moves in, it is going to pull in glucose and galactose into the cytoplasm. So glucose and galactose move in.
along with the sodium gradient. It means, see the working or the functional ability of SGLT1, it is entirely dependent on sodium potassium ATPase function. So, sodium potassium ATPase is an primary active transporter using ATP, it's going to pump out sodium and bring in potassium. So, that's how sodium gradient is maintained. So, thereby SGLT1 can work. It means SGLT1 is indirectly consuming ATPs here. Although it is not directly consuming, but ATP is needed for sodium potassium ATPs so that SGLT1 can work. That is why SGLT1 is referred as secondary active carrier mediated sodium dependent glucose transporter 1. So, it all needs sodium gradient to pull in glucose and galactose. So, glucose and galactose comes into the cytoplasm along with the sodium. Now, there is another transporter on the brush border epithelium and that is GLUT5 transporter. Now, the glucose 5-transporter is sodium independent transporter. It means it is a facilitated transporter. It works on the concentration gradient. If the glucose, galactose and fructose concentration is less in the cytoplasm of enterocyte and more in the lumen of the enterocyte, so glucose, galactose and fructose, they all three of them, they move into the cytoplasm. As long as this gradient is maintained, so glucose, galactose, fructose, they are absorbed into the enterocytes. So, GLUT5 works on the sodium uh, gradient of glucose, galactose, fructose, whereas SGLT1, it works on the sodium gradient. Now, the glucose, galactose, fructose gradient is always maintained. That's because glucose, galactose and fructose, all of them, they will be continuously taken out of enterocytes into the portal capillaries and that will be done by another transporter which is located on the basal surface and that is called as GLUT2 transporter. GLUT2 transporter, it is a low affinity transporter. Km for GLUT2 transporter is 15 millimolar. It means whenever there is accumulation of glucose, galactose, fructose in the enterocyte, during that time, it's going to pull it out of enterocyte into the portal circulation. From there, it will be carried to the liver and other peripheral tissues. So, it means we have two transporters on the basal, um, on the uh, brush border surface, SGLT1, which is dependent on sodium gradient and GLUT5, which is dependent on gradient of that molecule itself. So, why, we, why do we have two transporters to do the same job? It's because just in case if one transporter is mutated, say if SGLT1 transporter is mutated, there is a GLUT5 transporter to take care of things. Or if the GLUT5 transporter is mutated, there is SGLT1 that can take care of absorption of monosaccharides. So this is how efficient absorption of monosaccharides will go on in our intestine, thereby glucose, galactose and fructose are not retained in the lumen of intestine. What if glucose, galactose, fructose are retained in the lumen of intestine? What happens? Note that these monosaccharides, they are osmotically active compounds. It means they are going to imbibe water from the enterocyte into the lumen of intestine. Thereby, they can lead to osmotic diarrhea. Okay. So, that can, that will be prevented with the help of these two transporters, SGLT1 and GLUT5 transporters. This is all about absorption of monosaccharides. Now let's move on. Now let's move on to see some of the clinical aspects, applied clinical aspects related with absorption of monosaccharides and digestion of carbohydrates. If there is any defect in uh, any enzymes involved in digestion of carbohydrates, they can lead to intolerance of that particular carbohydrate. Say if there is a defect in lactase enzyme if there is a deficiency or defect in lactase enzyme. So, that will give rise to lactose intolerance. Note that this lactose intolerance is commonly seen in uh, people who are descended from Asia or the Africa. Asians and African descent people, so by polymorphism, they have got less lactase enzyme expression or the brush border epithelium. So, they won't be able to tolerate 
too much of milk and milk product because of this what happens lactose gets into the colon and in the colon lactose is fermented by the bacteria into small chain fatty acids it can be fermented into methane hydrogen gas hydrogen sulfide carbon dioxide that kind of gases can be produced and that can lead to flatulence it can lead to and indigest i mean uh, undigested lactose can lead to osmotic diarrhea because of the osmotic effect osmotic diarrhea can be seen and patient will have bloating and abdominal cramps so these are some of the signs seen in lactose intolerance and genetically so asians and africans so they are deficient or defective lactose lactase enzyme on the brush border epithelium and also note that as we age on so from infancy to adult uh, childhood and then later into adulthood so the expression of lactase on the brush border epithelium will decrease now let's move on to see another applied clinical aspect that is carbohydrates indigestion or carbohydrate dumping if you eat too much of carbohydrate in too short time what will happen so the carbohydrates won't be digested properly in the small intestine so the undigested carbohydrate undigested carbohydrate so they just get into colon and they will undergo fermentation undigested carbohydrates will undergo fermentation in colon by colonic bacteria and they will it will give rise to flatulence osmotic diarrhea bloating abdominal cramps so that's what happens if you eat too much of food in too short time now the indigestible presence of indigestible carbohydrates some of the lentils and uh, beans or any vegetables some of them so they will have uh, carbohydrates which we don't have enzymes to break break them down so basically they will have complex carbohydrates complex carbs so these complex carbohydrates are not digested by the enzymes so again they will undergo uh, it will get into the colon and will undergo fermentation by colonic bacteria and that fermentation will give rise to flatulence op- osmotic diarrhea bloating abdominal cramps so that's the indigestible carbohydrates there especially because of complex carbs present in these molecules now acute or chronic inflammatory conditions of gastrointestinal tract so during this time what happens there will be washing of brush border epithelium because in acute and chronic inflammatory conditions so basically the there will be shredding of intestinal epithelial cells the brush border epithelium is shredded and as we have seen in my in our previous video about digestion of carbohydrates so all the disaccharidases and alpha glucosidase enzyme they are all located on the brush border epithelium so if you shred the br- brush border epithelium because of the inflammation so there won't be availability of this digestive enzymes will be less because of this carbohydrate digestion will decrease so there will be decrease in carbohydrate digestion and because of this what happens so undigested carbohydrate it will move into the colon again so colonic bacteria will ferment it and that can give rise to again flatulence osmotic diarrhea bloating abdominal cramps so this can happen during diarrhea itself diarrhea because of viral or bacterial infection so that's why it is not good idea to supplement or give a carbohydrate complex carbohydrate diet or too much of carbohydrates which need a digestion during uh, whenever the patient is having diarrhea itself so that can in enhance or that can worsen the diarrhea because of the osmotic effect of undigested carbohydrates so these are some of the applied aspects related with carbohydrate digestion and absorption of monosaccharides i hope this video helped you in understanding absorption of monosaccharides and also collectively looking at clinical aspects related with carbohydrate digestion and absorption of monosaccharides Thanks for watching. See you again in my next video. Take care.